to learn about the off-grid lifestyle, and to be inspired to live your dreams, click subscribe so you don't miss anything. Hit the bell notification. All right, so we're back at the uh, tiny house again today with our little chickens. Take them out of the top of the box and bring them down here underneath the box. And this is all the mess they have made just today alone. They are eating and, and drinking like crazy. Very friendly chicks. So we're really having a good time. They're having a good time. And this, is, this little setup we got here is working out really well. I like it a lot. It's not taking up a huge amount of room. We still can get around the house pretty good. They're very friendly. This is the first time I've ever had buff Orpingtons. Well, we, and we got them in our little chicken tractor. And at nighttime, we put them up at the top. And then during the day, they come down here so they can see out. We've noticed that they really like being able to look out. I think we're going to keep them in here for about six weeks. I did the math, and if you take in the calculations of both the upper and lower decks here, there's plenty of room for them. But Carolyn decided to put newspaper down and a few of the mulch, a little bit of mulch, just to keep the smells absorbed a little bit. That'll be easier to clean up each day. This is like their playpen, I guess is the best way to put it. Sure is neat watching them. Oh, there's water back there. Somebody's going to say, where's the water? You don't have any water. It's, they've drank quite a bit. Carolyn just filled that today, this morning. What, maybe two hours ago? Wow, that's a lot of water. So on days that it's manageable, you know, with temperatures in, in the range of I can do some work, I always try to go down and do something with firewood in the evening, four o'clock in the evening. I have a bunch of firewood down in the woods down here that I drag up, you know, one little wagon full at a time. I just got this little hand wagon that I drag around. So I just bring up a couple wagon fulls a day and eventually I get it all up here. And so eventually my stacks start looking like this and they all take shape. Today I came down here and uh, my stack fell over. This is the third time this has happened to me. Now the first time, I think somebody did it on purpose. I think it was 4th of July weekend is what it was, or the fireworks knocked it over, I'm not sure. It's hard to say what knocks them over. The wind, I mean, it's just they're real sturdy one minute, next minute they're not. Now the way I've really prevented them from falling over is I have two stacks of firewood. So like here, you'll see that I got two stacks. So they kind of fall in on themselves. It really has slowed down how many stacks of firewood has fallen over. But this one was a single stack. I hadn't gotten to a second stack. As a matter of fact, I was gonna start a second stack today. That's what my plan was. So I won't be dragging any firewood up today because I got to restack this, this stack. I brought up this metal piece here. This came off the old trailer. We cut off the mobile home. We cut the mobile home trailer in half, basically. Well, less than half, I guess. And we built our house on the remaining trailer frame. But this, we cut off in eight foot sections here. And we were going to scrap it, but since then, we've used it for everything. And one of the things we use it for is to stack firewood on. And it's really easy to use because you can level this. And the whole thing becomes level and you just start stacking your firewood. Well, so I started moving this around and I bumped the firewood pile over here. And a, a bunch of pieces fell off. Now before I explain what happened here, you know that I've had a lot of trouble with firewood this year. We had a whole bunch of seasoned firewood down here at the Franklin wood stove. I've told you about this. I got an outdoor Franklin wood stove heater over here that I made. It's homemade. I'm starting to tear it apart now, but that's how we heated the camper. Well, I had, uh, I'm, don't quote me, four or six cords of wood. And my goal was that should last us all winter. Well, it didn't get us through December. That Franklin just chewed through the firewood. I mean, it was massive how much it used. Now we're up here in the tiny house. We haven't hardly used any. But the problem is, is up here in the tiny house, this stove requires us to use dry wood. Now, when I say dry wood, somebody corrected me and said, maybe your problem is why people aren't understanding what you're talking about is some people call it green wood. The wood's still green. So let's talk about it's not seasoned. Wood has to sit around for a year to be seasoned. You can, they talk about kiln drying and all this, but the best way and the easiest way to, to dry it is to stack it up, let it dry. So I started picking a piece up and I picked this one up. I thought, boy, this piece is awful white. So I split it 
and you can actually see the water. Once you split, you can see the water just, it, it's, it's a different color. So, I mean, I didn't even test it. I'm sure it's up there in the 30% range. Now I bought that and this guy said it was cured or dried or seasoned or whatever you want to call it, but it wasn't. I mean, he he's had to have cut it like, you know, last week. But the thing is, is as I was stacking this side, a few of these logs fell over. Now this I cut around August. So it's not even six months old. And I haven't really paid much attention. I haven't come down to this corner hardly at all. I picked it up and it was pretty light also. So I did go get the tester for that because, I mean, look at this. The bark is falling off, which is an indicator that it could be dry. It's cracking. You can see the cracks indicated it's dry and it's very light. Now, this is oak. This, I mean, oak is hard to dry. I thought, there's no way this is gonna be dry. So I went and got the tester and I split a log and the very first one I tested was 17%. Now, in order to burn the firewood into that wood stove, it's gotta be 20% or less. So I just started grabbing a whole bunch of them and I split it and tested, it, split it and tested. It. And the highest one I came up with was 19%. So everything is under 20%. So I think I got enough firewood just right here in this little corner that it's going to get me through the rest of the winter. This lifestyle is absolutely amazing to me. How I came down here all frustrated that my wood pile fell over and I'm going to spend the next all night picking it up probably. Although I'm making a video now, so I probably won't even get it finished tonight. I probably have to start, start on it again in the morning. And then I find out that all my problems that I've been having with this wood stove up here because it's not dry enough, the wood's not dry enough, has just been solved. This is a gold mine to me. I, I wish I could explain how important firewood is. It, it's, it's, it's a valuable asset to me. It's, it's better than money to me sometimes. This is sustainable. This is something I can do for a very long time and keep me warm it's, it's better than a dollar bill so those who've been with me for a very long time will know where i got this from there's a city park all oh, by three miles from here and an old oak tree had fallen over in the springtime i had to ask around for about it uh, the the town is an unincorporated town they voted uh, oh i forget when 2015 to unincorporated they didn't want to pay the high taxes anymore so the townspeople take care of the city. It doesn't have a mayor, or, you know, city council or anything, but it has an old park still. It has a, a spring that runs through it until people actually go down there and, and get the water out of this natural spring. People cut the grass in the park. People maintain the roads, you know, the best they can. They'll fill it in little potholes with gravel or whatever. Well, this tree fell down and I, I new to the area, didn't know how I could obtain this tree. So I called the county seat and asked them if, who I could talk to about this firewood, this old oak tree. Now this oak tree was massive. One limb on the tree was 14 inches in diameter. So all the little limbs, 14 inches in diameter. That is a basically a normal sized tree. This tree is probably, the, the trunk of it is four feet in diameter. In order to cut it, in order to get the trunk, th this right here is the trunk, right here. I had to take my saw and cut it into sections. So I would cut it my 18 inches. Of course, it's four feet, so I only got, you know, I don't even have two feet. So I would cut it in sections, cut it, and I just had to keep splicing it and splicing it. So all this you see right here is chainsaw cut. I didn't do any splitting. It's all cut with the chainsaw. So, but this right here, this is the limb, not, not the trunk. That's what's dry. So the county seat really didn't know how I could get the tree. And then I saw the guy cutting the grass and I asked him about it. I said, do you know how I can cut that tree? Is anybody wanting it? He says, no, I, if I was younger, I'd do it, but you're more welcome to it. First come, first serve. And then there was a lady at the gas station. She's very friendly to us every time we go in there. And I asked her about it. She says, you know, my husband used to do that. He would go down there, cut those trees down in the city park, but he hurt his shoulder last summer and he can't do it. And he was hoping that somebody would go and get it. So uh, I went and got it. Now, there was a big soap opera drama, the whole thing. I was going down there every three days to pick it up because I didn't want to be greedy. If somebody else wanted it, they were more than welcome to go down and get it. This old man came over and he was a cusser. He just liked to cuss. I don't think he was specifically cussing at me. He was just mad. So apparently his friend was supposed to come over and cut the tree for him. And he was an older guy. I say older, he was my age. 
So I thought, you know, I better take a break. I, I better just slow down on this. It took like, you know, two weeks off from cutting. And I came back and nobody had touched it. I cut it again after two weeks and then came back in three days, cut it again. Well, then his wife come down. Now she was much younger he, and she comes down. She's a little bit nicer, but still, didn't my husband tell you he wanted this tree? And I said, well, he's more than welcome to come down. I, I come down every three days. I actually took a few days off, you know, a couple weeks off so he could come and get it. Well, he doesn't have the equipment right now. His chainsaw is broken, uh, just, you know, all the excuses. So I just took a break for the longest time. I didn't do anything with it. And I was able to get all this from that, from, you know, that episode. Well, after, I don't know, a couple months, I, he, he still hadn't touched it. He, he cut a couple branches, but that was about it. And that's when I started cutting into that trunk. That was this stuff right here. I ended up just leaving the, the remainder of it. There's probably six feet left of that huge trunk. So it's six feet long by four foot in diameter. I hope that I can inspire you to find the good in the bad when you're living your dream. Thanks for watching.